What's up, everybody? Clint Fauché here, and... I'm Albert Chavez. Welcome back. And it's Front Porch Chronicles, and today... We've got a, a, a up and coming guy. I still, I'll never forget uh, Matthias Nikolau. I'll never forget when I met you the first time in Orlando. Uh, you were on the same fight card with Hoffa. And so we introed or whatever, and we were walking away. And I'll never forget this, and this should stick with you. Hoffa said he will be a champion. He 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 said that flat out. Like he, I said, is he that good? He said, man, his skill set, his mindset. He said he is just, he is a very good guy, and he will be a champion. So he, he thinks very highly of you, uh, and so you instantly had a fan in me, and then I started kind of following you more. Uh, and and kind of started to uh, uh, follow your career, and and it's a pleasure having you on today. And we'll jump right into it. Uh, I know you trained with uh, Timo Nuva Ano in uh, Rio, uh, one of my favorite squads. I love Day Day, uh, Johnny Pahate. I know RDA trained there. So let me ask you, how is it training? there with so many killers on deck yeah first of all thank you for having me here is a pleasure and i'm really honored about what hafa said coming <laughs> from a guy like him if he knows everything about the game so what i can do is work my ass hard every day <laughs> and make it happen so that's what i'm doing and yes man he is uh is it's unbelievable, you know, I have no words to describe how I'm glad I am to be able to train at Rio. I'm from Belo Horizonte. I came from uh, Caveirinha's uh, Jiu-Jitsu gym. It's a gym that Rafael trained there. That's where I met him before. And I moved to Rio when I was, uh, when I was 18 years old. I had uh, two or three pro fights. My first pro fight, I had, I had only 17, so <laughs> wow. it was really really uh amazing for me because over there when i moved to rio it was when i really started to train like mma i mean i trained mma vale tudo since i was 15 but in rio i started to train really professionally you know like we had all types of good of training there and they all very high level like you said we have a high level wrestling by coach pirata we have a high high level jiu-jitsu we we don't need to tell much about Nova Union and it was the roots of Nova Union. And we have great Muay Thai, great kickboxing, great boxing. So I will, I'm really, really happy that I made the move to go to Rio when I was 18 years old and training not just with the best coaches in the world, but also with the best training partners in the world. I remember the first day that I got in Rio, I was uh, waiting on the reception, on the entrance, mm -hmm. and it was like only the guys that I, I admire a lot coming to the gym, like Dudu Dantas, Jose Aldo, <laughs> Renan Barão, Tony Stories, Akran Diaz. I was like, you know the kid when you go to the park? I was like, that man, how it is. Like, all of my, my idols are, are here coming to training. And not just that, everybody's so open, so nice to me. So it was really nice. It was an honor. I'm really glad that I made that move when I was 18 years old. Yeah, you said you started super young. How was it training with those athletes? Like, were you kind of starstruck at first? And like... Or we just get right into it. You're just like, hey, I know this is my time to shine and just get in the ring and just do what you needed to do. Yeah, you, for me, I was so uh, fortunate because for me, everything happened so natural, you know. Uh, I started training uh, when I was 15 years old for MMA. I, I was like two years trying to do a mounter fight, but back, back in the day, we did not have much of a mounter event going on. So MMA was starting to grow. The UFC was starting to grow. Back in the day, was when I started, was even more valid to do than really MMA. So it was kind of that transition to make the sport really professional, you know? And everything happened like so natural for me. It's just something that I really like to do and was not like hard to do you know it was easy because it was something that i love to and that's how i started i started training and 
Uh, I remember that at the beginning, when I was in Belo Horizonte, we didn't even have like those sparring gloves for MMA. So we used mm -hmm. to do like slaps <laughs> and kicks and grappling, you know. That's how we started to train. And then I came to Novo Union and it was like another world. Like they was already so professional. We have Barão as a world champion. Dudu was Bellato world champion. Jose Aldo was UFC world champion. Legends. I think when I, yeah, I think when I got there, they was making the transition to WEC to UFC. Mm. I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, I saw Aldo defend, uh, fighting the UFC for the first time. So it was a huge honor, you know. I, I was like, every day I was learning something new just by watching and see those guys, how they eat, how they carry train, themselves, how they sleep and everything, like the techniques and everything around the MMA, you know. Yeah, that's where I learned how to be a high level athlete. So let me ask you this: When did you start? I know you said started at fifteen. W did you do jujitsu before that, or any training before that? What age did you start? Yeah, I started in jujitsu when I was nine years old. Oh, wow. But back in the day, my dream was to become a soccer player. <laughs> so the idea was the jujitsu to help me on soccer to give me more balance oh. and everything, you know like and to evolve my body as uh, as a whole yeah and then i because my mom always would charge me a lot about the school i have to get good grades and stuff like that so i stopped the jiu-jitsu for a year i started with daniel mateus uh, uh aldo caveirinha black belt today he's a police officer in brasilia from the special squad yeah and then when i go back when i was 13 uh rodrigo uh freitas he was teaching the same thing gym that i started and that guy rodrigo freitas i'm in his house now here in redondo beach mm -hmm. he's the guy who make me really fall in love for all the process you know the way he was brown belt back in the day so he was working so hard competing every weekend and stuff like that to get his black belt and just by seeing him the way he did everything the way he he loves the way I just, I fall in love too, you know, and it was really nice for me because he was competing a lot in travel all the week, weekends, and he came to my mother and he already knew my mother because he had studied with my older brother before. So this helped me as well because my mother got confidence on him and let me travel with him to go to competition and stuff like that. And then I started jujitsu. But then Jigo moved to US. When he moved to US, I came, I start training at the Caveirinha HQ, the headquarters of Caveirinha. Mm. And back in the day, we haven't uh, the MMA team no more. So the Vale Tudo guys like Rafael dos Anjos, Igor Araújo, everybody who used to do MMA have travel and they was teaching around the world like. Igor was in Switzerland, that's why I fought there twice on the beginning of my career. And Igor Araujo was the guy who told me, hey, there's two places for you to go because you're a light guy. You can go to Team Alpha Male, which is pretty far away from your home, or you can go to Rio de Janeiro, which is like seven hour bus. And for me back in the day, I didn't even have an American visa. So I thought, hey, I think Rio de Janeiro is more realistic for me now. And that's why I went to Rio. He talked to Ian Cabral, was a good friend of him, and I opened the door, talked to the day and everything, and I moved to Rio to 18. But yes, I started in Jiu-Jitsu, and then when I was 15, uh, and Caveirinha was traveling to Hawaii, right now he's based on Hawaii, he told to Gabriel Mudo, one of his black belt that used to fight Vale Tudo, but he was not fighting Vale Tudo back in the day anymore, uh, to teach me. He said, hey, Mateus is always on me asking to, to start MMA and Vale Tudo. Could you teach him to start a class? So we start a class, me, Mudo, and some of my friends that was almost my age, like a little bit older than me, but was all like blue belts and stuff like that. And the funny thing is when I make my debut, Gabriel Mudo fought on the same day. So the nice thing is he started by teaching me and soon he become my training partner and I was always motivating him to train. And we fight together, if I'm not mistaken, two or three times. Like I fought and he fought later on the same day. So that was so nice for me. I, I, I always say that I'm so blessed to have all those guys uh, sharing the path with me because they put me in the right path since the beginning. Like my first jiu-jitsu professor who 
taught me a lot, always uh, give me good motivation, always put me to go to compete and stuff like that. And then I met Mudo, who, man, he took care of me like I was his son. He came to my house every day to pick me up, uh, get me to training. I compete to teach with him, travel a lot. We compete MMA on the same day. And then I made, I made my move to Rio when I was 18. Mm. So, so let me ask you this. What did your, did, so your mom knew you were into jujitsu. She knew you were kind of sparring or whatever. What did your mom, what, what did she, when you, when you finally made the decision, like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to be an MMA fighter. Did she, did she know? And what, what did she think? Like, was she like, what are you doing? Cause most people, like you said, most people's parents are going to be like, you need to get your edge, especially at the age you were like, you yeah. need to get an education. What, what did she feel about you? So at the beginning, it was harder to convince her that I was going to do jujitsu than MMA because uh, mm -hmm. when I was about to do jujitsu, she was kind of, we still have some, you know, jujitsu is start like, uh, um, uh, like, oh, they are all brawlers, they are street fighters. We, we had that thing, you know. Today is completely different. People respect the sport as a professional mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But at the beginning, it was hard to convince her when I was 13 that, man, mom, I want to do jiu-jitsu. And she, I had to cry to her and everything. <laughs> but since... Since she knew that my my professor was going to be H Rodrigo, she got all cool because she loved him. Mm. So that helped me a lot. And when I decided to do MMA, she already saw how much I was training hard for jiu-jitsu. I was competing in jiu-jitsu a lot. How much this was good for me. Yeah. You know, because at the beginning she was afraid, of, oh, she's going to do... Running in the streets. The wrong thing. Yeah. yeah. And she saw there was nothing like that. The only mm -hmm. thing that I did was like training, training hard and resting. And I, I usually, I and I start to spend more time in, the ho in home because I was all tired and stuff like that. So when I start the idea to become an MMA fighter, she was already cool with the sport and everything. And in my first fight, because I had only 17 years old, he got to sign a way. Yeah, that's, that to, that that's what I was going to gonna, fight. Yeah. Did, she, has she, did she go to the fight? No. Even <laughs> Jiu I think it... Jiu Jitsu, she, she went like once, but she did. She got too nervous. She cannot. Uh, even the television, she doesn't really. Does she, she doesn't watch? Really see does she what, watch now? Like she watched, but not really paying attention. She always <laughs> tried to do something wrong, like, oh, I gotta clean this. Oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. And then when people scream, she, oh, what's going on? Oh, yeah. it's good, it's good. You can't see. Yeah. Like, and then she goes, she watch a little bit, and then she go to do something else. You know, yeah. she, she gets too nervous. She's I, a mom. I got her. Yeah, she's I, a mom. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, I get it. So we'll get into, uh, we want to get into the Cape situation, all that, but you, you, you hit on something with soccer. You know, I'm a, uh, I, I, I got into me, Hoffa, Hafinha. Uh, we all have like constant competitions on FIFA on the video game. Like I, I bought a PS5 specifically for like I get home and I have the headset and I'm playing against them. So uh, who is your favorite te uh, team and who is your favorite player when it comes to soccer? Yeah, so that's another funny history. My favorite team is Atletico Mineiro it's from my city. Mm -hmm. I played for Atletico before when I was oh. a kid. And my favorite player is Ronaldinho Gaúcho. And he also played for Atletico, something that I never believed that was going to be possible because he was my, like, uh, my teenager idol, you know, <laughs> Ronaldinho Gaúcho. I used to watch him play for Barcelona, PSG, on the Brazilian national team. So he was, like, my biggest idol on the sport. Mm -hmm. And then time passed and he come to my team i didn't believe it hey, how is possible ronaldinho to play for atletico mineiro uh -huh. and he not only played for Atlet atletico mineiro but he won uh several very important championships our first copa libertadores which is l like the south america tournament yeah. It's like yeah one of the biggest of the south america teams he got the first one for atletico so he is you my favorite <laughs> soccer player, and Atletico is my favorite team. Was it hard giving up soccer for another love in jiu-jitsu? 
So it was a little bit, but uh, there was something that helped me to make that decision because my father, he was one of my biggest support. And as I used to play soccer since really young, I was kind of really tired to doing the same thing. I already want to move. And then I started to do so my father is still alive. And I remember that, you know, father, they know their son. He kind of saw how much I was into jiu-jitsu. And I remember he came to me and said, hey, what do you want to do? Want to be a fighter or want to be a soccer player? Back in the day, I was kind of afraid to tell him that I wanted to change my dreams and my plans mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But then a few months later, he passed away from nothing. You know, he was 15 years old, all healthy. And he had a heart attack. Oh, shoot. And when he passed away, the only thing that I want to do it is to come to the gym and train jiu-jitsu. And like a week later, I came to my brother, Eduardo, who was the guy who always supported me to do whatever I want. He used to get me to the soccer uh, classes with Buzz every day and stuff like that. He, I was really close to him. We sleep in the, on the same room. I came to him and said, hey, do, do, do. I call him do, do. Yeah. Uh, I want to change. I want to do jujitsu. I want to be a fighter. And he came to me and said, hey, whatever you want to do, just go hard, you know, do your best. You can get it. And then I, I made the decision to follow my heart and to become a fighter. You know, at the beginning, a jujitsu fighter, but I, I started jujitsu by watching Vale Tudo tape. So since the beginning, I wanted to try Vale Tudo MMA. I started jujitsu already knew in like, uh, hey, one day at least I want to do Vale Tudo, you know? So that's how I make the move to become a fighter. Like I just follow my heart and say, hey, that's what I want to do. And I think like, it was a bad thing, a worst thing ever that could happen to me. My father passed away, but it was also something that gave me the strength to like, no, I'm going to decide what I'm going to do in my life, you know, and then I, I, I make the decision. And, and, and think about it from this standpoint. Think about the man you are now and everything you're doing. He's he's looking down on you, smiling, knowing that you followed your heart, man. That's that's. That's that's yeah. really big. That's really big. So yeah, I believe this. Even because he used to love to watch boxing, I remember mm -hmm. like he was wake up until the middle of the night to watch Mike Tyson. <laughs> Mike Tyson finish the fight so quickly. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that if he was alive. He was be pretty, really proud. You know, he would be coming to my fights and everything. So he's, he's proud looking. over there. Yeah, yeah he's, no he's doubt. Still proud he's still there. watching for sure. Yeah, no doubt. So let me let me ask you this. After Cape talked all that shit, and, and he talked a lot, how was it showing up? And I, I follow you, so like I know, and and I fought. Uh, you know, we had Eric Anders on yesterday. I fought back in the day, never at this level. I fought on uh, like a smaller promotion. I fought with Eric back before he went on to the UFC. The hardest thing ever for me has been the weight cut. Most people that I talk to, like I'm, I'm flying out, uh, I think next week or the week after for Hoffa to finish out his weight cut. Um, and to me, that is by far the most brutal part of the sport and the most brutal part. Like people always ask me, what is the toughest thing? And I'm like, Honestly, the weight cut, I, you could punch me in the face a thousand times, but when you take away my food and you take away my water, it makes things more difficult. So let me ask you this. When did they let you know? Did they let you know anything? Did you have any inclination ahead of time that he wasn't going to make weight? No, that's the exactly problem, you know. Mm. If he had called me the night before or even the morning before, okay, we could do a, a catch wage. But no, I made the wait and then like 30 minutes before the scale got uh, shut down, uh, the time for the wait, mm -hmm. uh, the dad came to me and said, hey, I heard Capé is coming here uh, almost four pounds before the wait. And right away, say, this fight's not going to happen, man. Uh, it's not money, it's not nothing, you know. Uh, we can see um, how the athletes who do not make weight have an advantage. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, daily basis, like uh, on a normal day in the gym, I used to train with guys two, 
four, five, six pounds heavier than me, and that's all okay. But when someone dehydrate, make all the heart mm -hmm. process, and the the body is so de so debilitated, and the other guy is not, these play a whole difference. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a whole advantage. And the thing for me was like, he got in the weight team all healthy, all good. He was chubby, you know. He was walking <laughs> fast and stuff like that. He was the way he was talking. He had energy, you know. Mm. You could see he had the energy. So I don't know. If he made this on purpose to take advantage. If he just didn't want to go to the process, I don't know what happened. I he think said, he was oh, scared. I, I think it, you, yeah. you want me to tell you the truth. Uh, we talked about this back what a month. A month ago, yeah. we talked about this a month ago because we were hyping up fights and talking about fights and we talked about and albert asked me he said whenever you have a rematch with somebody what is the mindset going into it and and there's different mindsets and you can attest to this sometimes whether we want to admit it or not we know somebody is better than us whether we want to admit it or not, we know that even if we give our best, it's going to be a struggle to beat this person, whether it be in jiu-jitsu or whatever. I think he knew you were the more dominant fighter. I think he knew it was going to be a bad day for him. <laughs> and I feel like he talked all of that talk and he was disrespectful along the way. And I think he was scared. I think he looked for it. And I talked to Albert about this. There's people, and you you can attest to this, you can tell when somebody doesn't really want to fight. Like, you know when to pour it on because like, okay, this dude's looking to tap. This guy's looking to get out of this fight. I can just throw baby punches and he's going to act like he can't do something. I think he knew that he didn't want that smoke and that he wrote a, just to be honest, I think he wrote a check his ass couldn't cash. And, and you know, I, the, the part that I hated is I saw you going through the weight cut. So, you know, it was through social media, but I saw, and I could see the brutalness of sitting in there. So that's, you know, I, I agree with you. And that's something maybe, you know, the UFC needs to kind of, uh, address those type of things because it it sucks, man. Because like, d d I, did you do they pay you? And I know they do. Sometimes they do, or sometimes they don't. I'm not trying to get into your finances, but did they pay you? Because they people don't understand, especially coming from Brazil. You don't just fly over here for a fight. Like you fly your team over here. Uh, you fly, you know, you, you have food expenses that you pay We have for. extra auto rooms yeah. and everything, rent a car. So that was one of the things that I was, that I think they, in his mind, he was sure that was, that I was going to accept the fight the way oh. that it was. Because he knew that, hey, he come all the way to Brazil, he make way, he spent money, yeah, it's he's going to accept the fight. And it's not the first time he does that. I don't know if he was afraid or not, but I think he wanted to have an advantage on the rematch. Mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe to keep his KO power, maybe to have an advantage on the grappling, but he already made this before, and we can see the guys made... So there's a, a few points about that. Like you said, it's too convenient for those guys <laughs> to do not make weight. Because right now, the new athletic commission rules, the only thing that we can do is you get 25% of the show purse. Mm. If the guy win, we get nothing from the win purse. Mm -hmm. So if he beat me, he would still make more money than I do. So make no it's sense. And it, the yeah. guy, he getting no nothing, you know, like if he does win the fight, he go to the belt next. Everybody forgot. It's not over there on the share dog or topology or any record that, oh, the guy, this guy won, but he was overweight. This doesn't show any place. No. So it's too convenient for those guys to do not miss weight. And it sucks. It sucks because all the hard work that I put in, you know, I, I didn't see my family on the Christmas. I didn't see mm. my family on the New Year's. I spent my birthday, which was uh, January 6th, on a hard diet and things like that. But it's okay. This is part of the game. And I'm, I'm, I did it and I would do it again because I love to fight. I love my job and everything. But that's the thing, like, 
nothing happens for those guys who do not make 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 weight. And the worst th thing is like it was a co-main event. It was a really important fight on the card for the UFC and everything. And that type of situation makes me get bad with the event as well. Mm -hmm. Even the everybody from the event knows that I did my part, but they want to the show. They want to see. They show. wanted to see. Know? I agree. Yeah. They want yeah, to see this show go on, so it puts pressure on you because for them, and this is something that. Going with Hoffa, because I'm with Hoffa all the time, looking at some of the things that the UFC does and some things that need to be addressed is just this. It's it, it makes people almost a slave to the system because, again, like people don't realize you guys make good money, but you don't make enough like you have to pay you have injuries. You don't have, you know, you have to pay for your fight team. Like you have to pay for gyms. You have to pay for management fee. There's a lot of stuff that goes out. So I agree. I think that he, two things. I think he was looking for an advantage because we can call it what it is. I'm telling you, he didn't want that smoke. Number one. Number two, he was looking at it from the standpoint of this guy came all the way from Brazil here. It's a lot of money. We're the co-main event, so we're getting good pay because it's a co-main event. I kind of, because of Hoffa, I know, depending on what tier you are and how much you make. So as a co-main event, you make more money. I think he thought in his mind, hey, you know what? He'll take the fight. This is a dub for me. I'll get paid. I'll make more than him. And like you said, because you guys are both top competitors, you're right, both of you are right on the teeter of a, a win that puts you into title Contender. contention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Hoffa talked about when we had him on the podcast, we talked about how delicate it is dealing with situations like this because one loss can set you back five years. And in this industry, I see it all the time. There's longev like longevity isn't a big thing because you have injuries, you have life, you have, you know, the things. The mental strength to, to do all these weight cuts. Yeah, because like it's. Too. Yeah, it's, it's a toll all the way around. So I do, I do agree with you. I think that number one, they should have some sort of fine or some sort of uh, uh, punishment yeah. for I think just saying oh we're going to take 25% of your purse because you missed weight I think that that's not fair to the competitor that he's going against and it, it ultimately puts it on you because I had a friend of mine that we talk about MMA stuff all the time and he was like oh well, I don't he didn't know that I know you and so we were watching. He was like, well, I don't know why he just wouldn't take that fight. And I'm like, OK, well, first of all, you don't when you dehydrate your body, the mental aspect of it, it messes up your hormone levels. It messes up, you you know, your your you dehydrate your organs, you dehydrate your brain and everything. So you put someone who didn't dehydrate a day before against someone who dehydrated, it's not the two pounds or three pounds <laughs> that make difference, you know, it's all the process. Mm -hmm. That's what people must get it, you know, like it's not the weight. The weight's okay. If someone is four pounds more than I do on a normal day, all it's day. okay. Yeah, that's why I told him, man, why he didn't call me before and say, hi, I got sick a, a week before. Man, everybody got problems. Everybody got problems in, in the, the training camp. I fought against Divorak with a staph infection on my on my <laughs> uh, hamstring. And two days before the cutting weight, it shows up. After the cutting weight was terrible. I walk and I feel and I felt against uh, Tim Elliott. I have a staph infection like three weeks before. I have to stop to train in one week, take antibiotics and everything and I still make weight. I still did it. And if I was not able to do make weight because I know this shit happens okay, I would make a call. Hey man, I cannot make weight. Can we do a catch weight? Can we do something? It's the co-main event. You gotta respect where you are. You gotta respect yeah. the UFC. So that's what I want to people to understand who doesn't miss respect if the UFC was not me, was copied doing all those shitty things. I know? agree. And and another thing that is I, I, I like to point here is because they first 
offered us this fight for December, and I took it. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know if it was Cap, something on his side, he came back, hey, we cannot do this fight on December, can we, can we do it in January? And I say, okay. So he had time enough to mm. do a diet, to come down weight, you know. The, he didn't took this fight on like short notice or something like that. Oh, so he had time. So that was the problem as well. And just to finish here, I think that at least the commission would let us to like make any negotiation, you know, like it was used to happen before. Like, okay, you didn't make weight, uh, so let's take more or something i don't know what specifically but this gotta change like in russia i saw some events the guy who did not make weight he started the the round with one point less mm. so this makes sense because he already losing the round advantage. you know yeah. yeah so because the way it is right now the guy he only get advantage he do all wrong he don't he don't uh, extend his contract. You know he he don't do what is on the contract, what he signed up for, mm -hmm. and he has only advantage. You know what it is to lose twenty five percent of your of your show nothing. purse. Nothing, man. I'm I'm fighting today. I know where I wanted to be. I know what how much I work to be. What where I wanted to be. I want to be a champion. That will change my paycheck mm -hmm. for real. 25% of his purse is a good money. It will help me a few months, years, and that, but not but it doesn't, make a but difference it, in my life. Well, and you bigger know, bigger than that is, like I said, if you give an unfair advantage to somebody and you take a loss, now you're looking at you just came change. off, you just came off of a loss. This was going to be a big time win for you to put you right back into contention. Yeah. So if you lose another fight back to back, that puts that affects you because your future pay because it's more than just twenty five percent now. It affects your future pay. And then what's to say now you when you start chasing money as a fighter, it it affects you in multitudes of ways and it becomes cancerous to your career. So to be honest, and not because you're my boy, I commend you for not taking the money and not giving this guy retribution, there needs to be more people that stand up and say right is right and wrong is wrong. And, wrong is wrong. and if I lose some money here, I'll make that money back on the back end and it is what it is. Yeah, exactly. And the good thing, like even all the situation was shitty. I think this situation was, was one of the most weird situation I ever been in a fight game. Even loss sometimes was not that hard for me because, you know, uh, I was kind of thinking about, hey, did I miss opportunity to make more money? But at the same time, I, I was, no, man, I not follow the greedy, you know, not be the greedy guy. Mm -hmm. No, man, I'm going to fight on the on the right terms, you know. And the thing that I think helped me, uh, not just with myself, with my thoughts, and even the relationship with the UFC and all the MMA fans, all the MMA world, is that I didn't see one person on the middle of the MMA is coaching, coaches, manager, uh, fighters, not my coaches or my manager, other manager, other coaches, former fighters, everybody was telling me, hey, no, don't get this fight. Mm. You made the right decision. Even I saw Paul Felder uh, in an interview saying, "Hey man, three point five pounds. That's not. That's, that's too that's much. That's not even fair. Yeah. It, like, like how are you if, supposed if to I saw if he was like a half a pound or one pound, and I saw that he was trying to make weight, I would accept the fight. You know, it's not about the money. It's about the the fairness of the competition. Mm. Well, you said but he no, had, man. you said he had the chubby cheeks. That alone, yeah. I would have been like, no. Because I know when you, like, even when you suck, when you, I, I fought my last fight, I walk around at probably 190, 195. I fought my last fight at 155. And Bro, they had to literally, it was a struggle, but they literally had to carry me. And this was on a smaller promotion. This isn't even on the UFC type level, but I'm like you, I'm the type of person, if I sign something on the contract, I'm going to adhere to the contract, but I definitely am not going to put myself in a bad position. So let me ask you, let me ask you this going forward. 
would you ever fight him again? Yes, I would fight him or anybody else on the right terms. Yeah. You know, like him or anybody else. When I want to fight me okay we can fight one <laughs> ufc want to do this fight okay man i'm a fighter you know that's what i do i yeah. fight fights we, i never say no to any fight the ufc gave, gave to me and you guys can think that can ask that to mickey or, or whatever yeah you mm -hmm. know they want this fight they want this date let's do it you know i never thanks god until today there was never a fight that they they offer me which can happen oh no right now i can do it because i'm injured this can happen yeah. but this even like that didn't happen you know all the fights that they offer to us we accept right away and just one more point about this fight i am the guy giving him the rematch the yeah. first fight was close, <laughs> it was close. i'm not i'm not gonna lie the first fight was a close fight it was a good one it was a close fight yeah but i won this fight and I am the guy hunted higher than him. I come for a loss. I came from a loss. That's why he come from four of, I don't know, four win streak. That's why too. But I am hunting higher and I won the first match. So I am the guy giving him the rematch. Mm -hmm. So if he want to fight me, he got to do it in the right ways, in the right terms, you know? I, I agree. That's it. So he or anybody else. Like... I know how difficult it is to make weight. We can have some problems, you know, but if I do have some problems, I sh I guarantee you, I will try until the end to make weight, you know? And the funny thing was after the fight, a few days later, uh, a Brazilian guy who trained at the same training and conditional coach that I do, that I don't know this Brazilian guy, I never say hi to him, but you know, he's not my friend and nothing. He sent a message to my training conditional coach, hey, I was in the sauna doing my weight cut, doing the weight cut with my team, and I saw Cap there. He was there for a little bit more than 10 minutes, drink a little bit of water, and then he say, I'm done. And I, okay, that's bad. I, I, I kind of knew that he was not struggling. And then today, uh, yesterday, this week, uh, I went to training here in San Diego, and another guy who was cutting weight with his friend was about to fight. I will not say name. He said, hey, man, I was in the sauna too. I saw Capé and he told me the exactly same history. The guy was there for not more than 10 minutes on the sauna, drink your water all the time. And he said, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah, he's just not so committed. He didn't want to mm. do it. You know? <laughs> so it is what it is. Capé, he did it. I'm... I'm sure he's regret about what he did because all the MMA world is on him now. Like I could see all the comments and stuff like that. People was like, "Hey man, that was not right." You know, it was not like I said, half a pound, one pound, it was triple five pounds and stuff like that. So it just happened. So if you want to fight, I'm ready to fight, but gotta be on the right terms. Gotta be on the terms that you signed for it. Yeah. You know? So that that's how we're gonna fight. That's how. Don't come with some small tip for me, man. You know, yeah. I will not get your small tip. <laughs> no. you know? And man, I don't want your money. I wanna fight. I wanna fight my fights and get the the good paycheck. You know, I don't want your money. Get your money to yourself, to your family. You know, I just want to fight on the right terms. That's I, all. I like I like that you're thinking long term. And the more that I talk to you, the more I see what Hoff was talking about about your mental, your the mental side of it. I think you're one hundred percent correct in not chasing the money and 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 not getting into that ego mindset of. Uh, even though he's 3.5 pounds over, I'll fight him anyway. And I'll, I, 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 I can do it. I can beat you. I can kick his ass. No, man. That's, that's a fight. That's it. MMA. Not at this I respect level. everybody. Yeah, not I, have, this... I have my feet on the ground. You know? <laughs> yeah. like, I know how it is. Yeah, not at this level. So, are you going to take some time off now? Or are you planning on just getting back on the road? You're already in fighting shape, you know? So, that's the thing. I was supposed to take uh, some time off, but I'm here uh, near LA in my friend's gym, my first professor, and I love to train, so I'm training every day, <laughs> twice a day, you know. But the, the good thing is, is when you don't have a fight coming up and stuff like that, it's more fun, you know. So, even that I'm, try I'm training hard and stuff like that, but I feel that my body and my mind is not that much, you know, on a stress level. So I'm training. I do some private with uh, Justin Flores in San Diego too. So I'm trying to get better on my 
take down games already involved and thinking about the future you know i i know that soon we're gonna be some fight coming up and that's it so i i'm i'm kind of on a on a vacation mode <laughs> but my vacation is still training you know i, I just love this shit, man i i, I just love this yeah, so let me let me ask you a question. This is thinking outside the box. I know your girl fights as well. How much, because I know for me, I've had to break up with somebody before during a fight camp because like she's like, oh, I'm cooking and you're not eating. And I'm like, I can't eat. Do you understand? She didn't understand. So how much of it is a luxury for you to have someone that understands and knows the process of the weight cuts and, and the process of the training? How much easier does that make for you? It's a blessing, you know, like uh, we know each other and we we understand our path. We understand what we need to do and we understand uh, where we want to be, you know, like w where we want to get to it. So all the uh, sacrifice and the hard times, they are easier. Just like now, I had a fight on January 14th, I guess. And then, man, had no Christmas, had no New Year's. And in Brazil, you know how it is in Brazil. Yeah. We have party <laughs> all around the places. Not just for doing New Year's and uh, and the uh, Christmas, but like on the end of the, we the year, you see party all the time. <laughs> People are like living on that party mode. You know? <laughs> and we spend we spend the New Year's and the Christmas alone in our house. Actually, in the New Year's, uh, some friends come in, but it was just a small thing. It was mm -hmm. not a party, you know, on diet and stuff like that. And she was all cool because she knew it like, man, he got a fight, he got a purpose. And the same happened with her, you know, if she have a fight and we gotta do whatever that we gotta do, we're gonna do it together, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, we're gonna eat what we have to eat, uh, what we can eat, and that's no problem at all, you know? So this is really a blessing, man. I see a lot of uh, couples, they have hard times because fighting MMA uh, is a lot of sacrifice. It's just like anything that you want to do in a high level, yep. not just MMA. If you want to play soccer, if you want to play tennis, if you want to go to, you want to be a gymnastics, you want to be any type of Olympic athlete, you got to do a lot of sacrifices, you know? And having someone by your side that understand that is a blessing, man, because you know, half of the fights is gone. You don't have. Well, it also helps that she's a beast mode fighter, too. So have y'all ever, let me ask you this, have y'all ever sparred together? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> some, Who, some you, days do you want to tell? <laughs> yeah, all the days is not, man. When she's peace, is kind of <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, yeah, uh, let me ask you this. We'll go ahead. I know you just got done training. I want you to get some food and get some rest. I know you're on vacay slash work mode. So let me ask you this. One of the things we started doing is a final question. And so uh, what do you if, if today was your last day, if today was your last breath? What is it that you would want to be remembered by from the people, from your people? What 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 do you want to be remembered for? I wanted to be remembered as a champion, not just in my career, but in all of my relationships. You know, like I want people to have proud to share the, mm -hmm. this path and this life with me. I want to be someone who always try to I uh, bring people up and not bring them down, you know, help them in every way that I can. Not just financially, that's one of my goals. That's why I want money to help people, especially we are in Brazil. We have a difficult situation over there. A lot of people that need our help, you know, in family and stuff like that. But I want to be that guy that remember, like, hey, man, th that was a cool guy. You know, every time that was with him was a positive day. You know, that's what I want to be remember what uh, to be remember. Like, uh, I make a good difference, a difference in a good way in people's life. It, maybe it's just a hug. Maybe it's just an eye. Maybe it's just a ha session of training. Maybe it's just a talking. Maybe it's just to listen to someone, you know, but... That's how I want to be remembered. Someone who makes people's life better.
Well, I, I, I commend you. I, I will say this. You exude, and I don't know if you know this, you exude a positive energy and a positive vibe you. about you from the first time that I've met you. Every time when I, I pull up social media and you pull up, I instantly smile. Like there, And there's a few people that do that. You, Johnny Eduardo, Hoffa, there's certain people that just exude this goodness about them. And so you, you've got that in me. Uh, I'm not everybody, but you definitely have that in me. Uh, you got my respect, my honor. If you ever need me, you know, I'm always here. Uh, have a good rest of your trip. Uh, and Thank if you need anything, let us know. And we are signing off. I appreciate you, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for stopping Thank by. you, my brother. Thank you, Click. And thank you, Beto. It was an honor to be here. And let's do it again soon. After my next fight, after the next victory, we'll do it again.